Well, welcome. Those of you online who didn't hear the welcome, I welcome you as well to worship this morning at Eastwoods Presbyterian. I'm Kevin Gates. I'm the youth and uh, children's director here as well as the office administrator. Bill is uh, fulfilling his duties as a chaplain this week at uh, Kitsap. And uh, so we will be having a little bit of a different sermon today, hearing multiple voices as we celebrate Father's Day. So I'm really excited to hear from several folks. You'll see their names in their bulletin and you'll see their faces very soon. We'll also get a chance to hear during our stewardship moment from Todd, who is our partner with Friends of the Carpenter. So we have a lot going on today. Again, we're very glad that you're here. Hopefully you did, were able to get a bulletin or a kid's bulletin. Some of you, you know, Gwen, you might want to do the maze on the back. Yeah, it's very nice. And then you might have noticed as you came in, but we do have little Father's Day goodie bags. They say Happy Father's Day. So if you are a father, if you've ever had a father, we encourage you to grab a bag or two of candy. I made a lot more than we have here on site. And if you're online and want candy, please come on by. There's going to be a lot. So as we prepare to come together as a family of faith, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters in Christ. We remember that we at Eastwoods are a congregation celebrating Jesus by connecting with and caring for all people, and we start that with each other. Let's take a moment as we listen to some music by Carol and calm our hearts and prepare to worship together. This time I'd like to invo invite John and Donna Weaver up who will be leading us in our call to worship this morning. If you are able to, we invite you to stand for this and for the songs following. Good morning. To the Lord of Lords, lift your hearts. To the King of Kings, we bring our praise. The Lord has begun a good work in us. And the Lord will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus. For God is great, working wonders beyond compare. For the glory of God, we come to worship. Splash! 
heard a thousand stories. You may you be may seated. Be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like now to invite uh, Bill Reberg up. Bill is one of our deacons and will be leading us in today's prayer requests.
Father God, <clears throat> we give thanks today for all the fathers who are grateful for, all, for the fathers who have shown us our love, show encouragement and support through the generations. We pray for those who are grieving, distanced or estranged from their fathers, that they may be comforted. We give up thanks, thanksgiving and praise for, law, praise for Connie Pfeiffer. Is this the one here? Oh, I was getting a ring, okay. We give up thanksgiving and praise for Connie Pfeiffer uh, for this cancer free and continue to pray for her healing and return to good health after treatments and surgery. We also give thanks for healing of Barbara Murray's leg. Barbara is Carol Salveson's friend who required hospitalization this week to address infection. Barbara believes prayer support made a difference in this leg. We lift up praises for the successful surgeries of Cynthia's niece, Kathy, which prevented paralysis. We praise God for the good news that Gwen's sister, Julie, has received the following, uh, received the following an, an MRI. The cyst is not a concern at this time, and while not able to remove it, they were able to aspirate it and relieve the pressure. We give God thanks that Tiffany's Aunt April is cancer-free and will be monitored every three months. We ask God to guide the hands of, <clears throat> of Sandy Riedel's sister-in-law, Sylvia's cardiac team, to her, who has open, open heart surgery on Monday. And we pray that God will guide Larry, Larry Condon's surgeon to remove a serious growth under his eye Tuesday. May all of those experienced surgeries be comforted and have complete healing. We pray for Sandy's friend, Diane, as she battles blood cancer, and for Bob Koontz in his battle with cancer. We pray for our friends. We continue to pray for, for comfort and strength for Sherry and Dave Snyder and for the family of, um, the family of Yvonne, Sherry's stepmother who died last week. We pray for our friends, Grace Reichenbacher, Marilyn Simonson, Joyce Buckingham, Carol Scoville, and Jackie Carr. While it's been a long time since we've seen them, been able to visit, we hold them, in, hold them in our prayers and hearts. Lord, in your mercy and by your grace, hear our prayers. I'd like to ask you to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Bill. We have heard the Lord's promise. As we have asked him to forgive our debts, and as we do our darndest to forgive those who have sinned against us, hear the good news that through Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And I'd like to invite Pat Norby up who's going to be reading our first <laughs> yes. Okay. I said up. Oh. <laughs> who's going to be reading our first scripture passage today? The scripture this morning is from the New Testament. We're reading from James 1, verses 17 through 21. This is a New Revised Standard Version. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. This is the word of our Lord. And I will introduce my, myself. 
uh, as I did my last pre-recorded message from a road trip I had, and when I stopped, I knew this was going to be our Father's Day message. It is also the final biblical game changer, and we'll see how those biblical game changers connect to the faith of our fathers. Well, hi, it's Kevin. I'm coming to you today from Mount Rushmore. I thought this would be a great place to talk to you as we end our series, Biblical Game Changers. You see, most of our game changers, the people that we've studied, Abraham and Moses and David and Daniel and, and even Peter and John, they called themselves followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, a lot of us here as Americans, we can say, well, you know, we're citizens of a country that came from the presidents Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and even Roosevelt up there in the corner. But just like those presidents on the rock behind me, these men in the scriptures, well, they're not with us anymore. They created a nation, just like these guys helped create a nation. And they helped build a whole new way of gathering together as a people. But it didn't end there. America didn't end with the last of those presidents on Iraq. No, but we remember what they did. When we studied these different game changers, men and women who came together because God called them and they changed the world forever. But we didn't stop with them. No, there have always been people through history who were faithful to God. And when Jesus came, he showed us the very best way to be faithful to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who calls you and me. And we learned about them, that God is not just a God of the past. As a matter of fact, in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, Jesus says, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. God is there for you and for me and for all who would be faithful to what he calls us to. Well, let's go ahead and pray that we might have our own faith, not just of the past, but of the present and of the future for those who would continue to call themselves the people of God. Father God, we thank you for those who came before us, who came in this nation and who created that nation of Israel that we read about in Scripture. We thank you that Jesus came so that we would know you are not the God of the dead, but the God of the living who calls us to live life with you. Help us to make our own way today and tomorrow so that others could point to you and can say, this is the God of the past, the present, and the future. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day that maybe you can get out and see cool things like Mount Rushmore as well. And remember, these biblical game changers, they were ordinary people, just like you and just like me. And you, too, can make a difference in somebody's life. In the name of Jesus Christ, have a blessed day. And uh, as we celebrate these things, we also offer our uh, birthday blessings for those in our congregation. The folks that I have on my list today is, well, on the 21st, tomorrow, we're celebrating the birthdays of Stephen Scoville and Dolores Kennedy. And then on the 25th, Steve Graham. I don't see you here. I hope you're watching us. Happy birthday to you all. Let's lift them up in prayer. Father God, we thank you for all those who have a birthday this week. And we know that it's not just their birth or this birthday or even next year's birthday that blesses them. But every day, you give us good and perfect gifts. We ask that you continue to watch over those who have birthdays this week. And 
Whether we said their names or not, you know who they are. Bless them in your name and for your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to invite Pat forward once again, and this time I see she's still there, um, and she's going to introduce our stewardship moment. It's my very great pleasure today, um, as representing the mission committee, to introduce a gentleman who has come to give us some information. For many years, Friends of the Carpenter has been one of the groups that our mission commission has helped support. This faith-based group hosts a day shelter in West Vancouver that provides safety and a sense of purpose to members of our community. We probably are best acquainted with them through the miniature pocket crosses just like this one, and there are many available outside if you'd like to take one as you leave, that are produced by their clients and have been available here at Eastwoods and several other beautiful pieces of woodcraft that we have in our building. One of the things that was part of the graduation gifts for our graduates last week was a beautiful bud vase that was given to the graduates that was produced by Friends of the Carpenter. Um, I am very pleased to introduce Todd Thayer, the Executive Director of Friends of the Carpenter, who will tell us a little more about what they do, how you can learn more, and even become involved in their programs. Please welcome Todd. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. It's, it's great to get out uh, to the different uh, places of worship and meet folks. Uh, the good news is we are reopened. Uh, we reopened on June 7th. We had been closed, as you might imagine, due to COVID uh, for 14 months. And so during that time, we were able to continue uh, special orders. We work with Main Street Trader. If any of you have been there, it is a lovely, lovely uh, business that primarily deals solely in wooden furniture, custom furniture, uh, all out of various types of wood. And so uh, their owners uh, reached out to us uh, and said, you know, we'd love to have you make custom uh, furniture for us. So we were able to keep the lights on, keep the utility bills paid, uh, keep some staff on doing special projects. But Really, you know, the wood is just the medium. Um, I like to say it's the lure. Uh, because while we shape wood and we craft in wood, we change lives with love. Christ's love. When people come to see us, we primarily serve people that are homeless, people with disabilities, we serve uh, quite a few veterans um, that may be disabled, may be homeless, uh, but may simply be coming in because they want to find community. And so we work with a network of partners to be able to bring resources to these individuals. But when they come into our center specifically, we want to surround them with people that are going to simply say, how are you? My name's Bob. What's your name? And sit down and have coffee with them. Now, if they want to learn woodworking, we have scroll saws, we have uh, lathes. So if they have no uh, experience whatsoever, like me, I, I took shop <laughs> at Shumway Junior High School 50 years ago, um, it's not a barrier. Or if they don't want to have anything to do with the wood, there are other activities that we can have them do. But the point is, there are people there who have one mission, to help them build their self-esteem and realize their own value as a child of God and be there for them to help lift them up as much as possible out of their situation. We provide uh, showers for homeless folks. I'm working on getting a permanent shower facility in. I'm getting some permanent laundry facilities in. Uh, we provide them a hot meal. But again, the main thing that we provide them is that 
safety, that security, that friend that's going to follow with them. And we have many, many stories. If you come down to the center, I'd love to give you a tour and show you uh, some individuals who came in homeless, drug addicted, believing that they had no value, no worth at all, no relationship with God whatsoever, and who, because we were able to work with them, simply by sitting down with them and having a conversation, and over time, that conversation building into trust and a friendship and a relationship, we're able to work with our partners in the community, many of them churches like yourself, as well as other nonprofit partners, to get these people off the street into affordable housing, get them employed, get them back to where they feel that they're valuable parts of the community. And we're really a, a, a farm in a sense because the next thing we do when we get them up and we get them to where they're feeling good, we find them a church where they can have more community and, and a deeper relationship with, with Christ. So you have all been very supportive. Uh, what I would say is if you are interested, I'd love to stay after for coffee, uh, get to meet some of you and get to know you. Uh, I have some brochures, uh, business cards. Come down, take a tour if you'd like. Uh, we would love to take you through the facility. Um, it's, it's just a lovely, lovely facility. And again, thank you for your support. And we want to be able to support you folks as well. Uh, the lectern there is something that we made. Uh, but we, all, we do custom orders. If you folks have anything that you'd like to give out uh, as gifts, we can do that as well. Uh, but the main thing, again, that we want to be able to do in partnership with you is reach out to the vulnerable in our community, which you do through your ministry uh, here, and, and let them know that God loves them, um, they are not alone, and that they have value, and that people, people see them. Uh, so thank you so much for letting me share. Um, if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them uh, over some coffee or tea, but thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, Friends of the Carpenter is a ministry I connected with years ago when I brought some teenagers on a mission trip uh, here, and we were able to help serve in there and took those crosses back and shared them in eastern Washington and even over the Idaho border. Uh, Todd was telling me th these crosses go around the world. They're one of the simplest things that the folks are able to put together, and it it's a great to be able to say, I made this, and who knows whose life they're blessing. Thank you, Todd, and thanks for all of you for helping to, well, partner with Friends of the Carpenter. And one of the ways we do that is through the offerings that are given here. So at this time, I invite you to consider how you are going to give to continue this ministry and um, to continue our ministries out of this building in this neighborhood. And you can do that through the offering plates outside, the uh, QR code on the screens. Drop by the office, I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Carol's going to play our offertory while we consider the gifts of our time, talent, and treasure. join me in prayer. Father God, you've given us so much. We do want to give back to you. It's one of the ways we worship. 
and we say, thank you. Thank you for considering us of worth. Here are parts of our lives that are of worth to us, and we give them to you gladly. The time we have, the talents you have given us, and the treasures that help us get through the day, help us give so others might get through theirs today. Bless these gifts. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. For those of you who are online and might not be here to talk with Todd, we do have their information on our church's webpage. Just go under our mission partners, and you will find that. Someone took my script. So whoever came up here to speak, see if you have my script that you picked up. I thought that would be a good way to do it, but I guess it wasn't. <laughs> later out there let's talk some more dad jokes I know every one of you have one or two that's in your pocket so today we're going to celebrate fathers and what they've taught us and Father's Day holds many emotions for the sons and daughters those who had a loving father that passed away or those who never knew their dad those expectantly waiting to become a father and countless other situations surrounding the father-child relationship God uses this special day to draw us closer to himself, the one true Father who remains faithful and full of unconditional love for us all. We're going to listen to four different stories today about fathers. So you're going to hear different perspectives. And what we're going to do is answer this question. How do you see God's influence by the examples of your earthly father's faith? We will hear from Ted Cyril, Lisa Pickering, Jack Wass, and myself. So we're going to start with Ted. Please join us. Billy Graham once said, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. I was greatly blessed by God when he provided me with a very good and loving father, and for that gift I am immensely thankful. However, I'm fully aware that not everyone has been so blessed. My dad was a very practical and common sense man, Tal talents he passed on to me and through me to my daughter and son. Dad grew up in Crockett, California in the San Francisco Bay Area where he and his brother owned an auto repair shop and gas station. As a young adult, Dad became active in the Christian Endeavor Youth Group, where he met my mother. It was not long until Dad was called to full-time ministry and then went on to serve as a beloved pastor in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ for over 50 years. 
his final calling was to be pastor to the pastors for all the Christian churches in Oregon during the 1960s. Dad really lived his faith, always ready to help anyone with their spiritual or physical needs. As a young man, I was often embarrassed when Dad would meet someone newly when I was with him, since early in the conversation he would ask, where do you go to church? Dad loved life and had a great sense of humor, and he was quite a prankster also. The story was told that when he asked my mom to marry him, he wrapped the ring in a small box. Then that box in a slightly larger box, and that in a slightly larger box numerous times. So mom had to open many boxes to get to the prize. When our son Steve was younger, dad gave him an electric hammer. Dad had drilled a hole in the end of the handle of a common hammer and glued in a one-foot piece of an extension cord into the hole. <laughs> Thus, an electric hammer. <laughs> Dad's sense of humor has been carried on very well by my son and daughters. Well-known basketball coach Jim Valvano once said, my father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give another person. He believed in me. My dad did believe in me, even in my first year in high school when I wanted to switch majors from college prep to auto shop. He believed in me later when I decided I wanted to study to become a dentist. On Christmas 1956, dad or right after I had started dental school, mom and dad presented me with a revised standard Bible with reference on the title page, reference to 2 Timothy 2.15. This was one of the principles my dad lived by, and now he was passing it on to me. In the revised standard version, it says, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. I also like the way the message paraphrase interprets this verse. Concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of. Laying out the truth, plain and simple. This is what I've tried to do in my life, and now I very much enjoy seeing these same principles being lived out by my exceptional daughter and son, as they now demonstrate incredible parenting skills. As dad's earthly life was coming to a close, he was in the hospital being treated for acute leukemia. After many years of giving, he had learned to receive the care of another. A caregiver was with him on her knees washing his feet. She looked up and said to dad, just like Jesus did. My dad went home to heaven 33 years ago, but his influence lives on. May I offer a gift to you this Father's Day? The gift of God's love, once given away, will grow bigger than you can ever imagine. So big, I hope you'll give it away and share his love with others. Lord, on this Father's Day, help me to be more like the father my dad was. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> now we understand your sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you have a joke or two, don't you? And now we're going to uh, have Lisa Pickering share her story. Many years ago, I think it was the 70s. Was that, was that in the 70s? Of course, I don't know how I can remember back that far. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
but uh, there was a musical that I went to see on stage called Man of La Mancha. Has anybody seen The Man of La Mancha? Well, for those who haven't, uh, it's a story about a Spanish gentleman named Alonso Quijano, who reads so many chivalric romances that he loses his mind and decides to become a knight errant to revive chivalry and fight for honor and justice. As he, oh, and, and of course he takes on the name Don Quixote de la Mancha. You may have heard of Don Quixote. As he goes out to seek his adventure, he no longer sees the world for what it is, but only through the lens of his noble quest. And as he meets the villagers and ruffians along the way, he sees them as fellow knights and noblemen. And when he meets the beautiful peasant Aldonza, who is a woman of questionable reputation, he sees her as the high, the high-born noble woman to whom he dedicates all of his heroic deeds. He's, and in spite of her, in, in spite of who she is, and in spite of her past, he sees her as pure and chaste, and he gives her a new name and calls her Dulcinea. Fast forward to one of the final scenes. Uh, Alonzo has been forced to face reality, which proves to be too much for him. And so he's back at his estate, and he lays dying. He no longer remembers his exploits as Don Quixote, but only as, as a shadowy dream. But Aldonza finds him and begs him to remember. And he's puzzled why it would mean so much to her. So he asks her, well, what does it mean to you? And she says, everything, my whole life. You spoke to me and everything was different. You looked at me and called me by another name, Dulcinea. At this point, oh, no, I, I didn't tell you the end. Um, of course, when she says Dulcinea, he, re he remembers who he was. And of course, they sing one final number together, and then he collapses and dies. Um, at this point, I was in tears. Uh, the actor that played Don Quixote had so embodied the character that for that moment, I had completely forgotten that that actor was my dad. Uh, even in real life, in many ways, my dad embodies that character and holds those ideals. He has lived his life with honor and integrity, and I have always respected and admired those qualities, admired his desire to always do the right thing, even when it hurts. But still, it's not those particular qualities that have reflected the heart of God to me the most. You see, my life has been a series of ups and downs. I've had some times of growth and success that he could be proud of. And I've had times of deeply disappointing failure. And during some of those times, Dad and I have argued intensely. We've argued over what's right and wrong. And even the, the very grace of God. Yet, he has loved me unconditionally through it all. And that's what reflects the heart of God to me the most. In the fourth chapter of Peter, Peter is in the midst of exhorting the church to suffer for Christ, to put away selfish desires, and to live for the will of God. And right on the heels of that, he writes, Above all, love each other deeply, because love 
covers over a multitude of sins. That kind of love is a gift from our Heavenly Father. And it's that kind of love that the Holy Spirit empowers us to give to each other. There's nothing we can do to earn it. And there's nothing we can do to lose it. He gave his son so that we could be reconciled to him. And like Don Quixote's gift to Aldonza of a new name and a new life, so when we receive Christ, he gives us a new name. And he no longer sees us for what we were, but for who he created us to be. He sees us as his children and always through the eyes of love. Thank you, Lisa. I would love to see that rendition somehow or other of seeing Ron play uh, in Don Quixote. That would have been beautiful. Um, <clears throat> when Bill was selecting people to speak today, I didn't know that he was going to reach out to my son, and he did, and my son agreed to do this. So as a surprise to you, Keith, uh, Jack has a message about fathers, his own father, for you, but good lessons from all of that that he will share with you on this video. Hello, my name is Jack Bloss, and my dad is Keith Bloss. Um, my mom is Gwen Wagner, but it's Father's Day, not Mother's Day, so we're going to focus on Keith today. Um, let's start with a story. When I was little, I remember my dad, my mom, and I were uh, on our way to some event somewhere um, outside of town. I think it, it was probably a baseball game or we were seeing family or something. And I recall my dad uh, saying something along the lines of, I should have grabbed that. And he was probably referring to sunglasses or a jacket, um, but I, at the age of six or so, turned to my dad and crudely said, you regret a lot of things, Dad. And I had no real idea what I was saying at the time. Um, but as I've gotten older, I, I get it. Um, I've developed my own regrets, and um, I see and relate more now to the internal trials that my dad and, honestly, all of us uh, face in big decisions and simple, minute decisions like wishing we'd grabbed our sunglasses or wishing we'd grabbed a jacket. These things just pile up. And so when I consider the ways that God has moved in my dad's life, I can speak most clearly to the way that he has called my dad to be a refuge for others. Several years ago, my dad was given the opportunity to lead the men's retreat at Eastwoods. And nervous as he was, he decided to do it. And he focused the retreat on the topic that uh, he might have been most ready to avoid, regret. For some reason, God was calling him not only to share about some of his regrets, but to lead others through his own life. And my dad said yes to that call. Because of my dad's obedience to that call and his vulnerability, a bunch of dudes were given a space to talk about the things that they wished that they could undo and how to face the reality of those decisions, how to move forward. It was during the same time that I was going through my own struggles as I transitioned to college life. And I found in my dad, someone who was willing to receive uh, my challenges and be a refuge of hope because he was choosing to accept God's invitation and face his challenges head on. Our relationship strengthened out of this time in ways that have drawn us closer to each other and have helped us to walk together, even as we're apart. I've seen my dad continue to be a refuge for others, someone people can share what's difficult with and receive the grace of 110% attention, curiosity, and compassion. He's embodied this in his work as a webinar producer, where he's been someone that teachers and other producers he works with can trust and confide in and someone whom all random students that show up from all around the world virtually, uh, they get to receive this deep sense of hospitality. He's embodied this in our family and amongst his friends, and I'm sure he's embodied this in many ways among all of you. Why is my dad like this? Think of Psalm 46, verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. In verse 7, the Lord Almighty is with us. 
the God of Jacob is our fortress. God created my dad to be someone reliable and trustworthy, present in pain, compassionate, and an incredible listener, so that God may be glorified and the world may experience the kingdom of God through him, so that people may know that God is our refuge and our fortress against real enemies, regrets, fears, and trials. I thank God for those of us that have gotten to receive God's gift as a fortress through my dad. I'm grateful for the ways God has influenced me through my dad to be a better listener and a faithful and reliable husband. The Lord is using my dad and many others, many other fathers, so that verse 10 of Psalm 46 may be true. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I have to tell you a quick story about us. <laughs> Jack was not, he was baptized um, when we were in California. We, we went to church, but Jack never went um, to church very often. And we moved here 10 years ago, and um, there were some people here that really embraced him as a young man who never really knew church and people at church. And to see what Eastwoods has done for my son is just incredible. Um, it was 10 years ago this spring that we came here, and I just thank you all, especially for you who were here before, just the love and support that you gave him um, to have him rise up and be such a good young man. So, now it's my story. <laughs> I think it's so fun to have different perspectives on this because we come to this, this pulpit with different perspectives on our fathers. Um, I was going to tell you that my dad is John Wagner, and he was raised in the western prairie of North Dakota. We have this picture of him in front of this 12 by 12 house that was a dirt floor with his sister in a buggy and his pregnant mother standing there with chickens about. There's not a tree to be found on the prairie. Can you imagine that life? They grew up very poor like many people on the prairie did. His mother died of typhoid fever when he was five and left these children for his father to raise. So my grandfather found a woman who also lost her husband and had a child and married her. Seemed to be what they did for survival. They uh, later, uh, as my father would say, we had brothers and sisters of 15. There were a lot of mouths to feed. By eighth grade, my father had to quit school to support his family. So he worked and sent money home for their education. He never got to go to school, but he was a very, very educated man. He was well-read, knew what was going on in the world, knew history, was really engaging person to speak with. He set the expectations that his children would all get college-level education, which we all did, and actually then some. We have four masters and a doctorate in our family. So education's become very important to us. He moved to South Dakota in the late 1930s, where he had a clothing store that turned into a dry cleaner and shoe repair. And then when the polyester became a very popular material, his business suffered greatly. Mom and, Mom and dad had nine children. One died shortly after birth. They had their struggles, as you can imagine, but always put God in the center of our lives. I swear, I spent just as much time at home as I did in the church growing up. We were always up there doing something. So I asked my siblings, because we are in texting to each other all the time, to come up with a couple ideas what they thought about this question about our father. And I saw some themes come through when you get eight siblings texting each other all the time. Number one, my father was generous, overly generous. As poor as he was, he always had something to give someone else. I remember people coming into the store and asking for a handout, and he would go up to the cash register, and I could hear that spring in the cash register pop open, and he would hand a dollar or two to this person. That money could have been used to feed his children. I don't know if he ever thought about it. All I knew is that what I saw, he gave without reservation. He would, would always offer you something if you asked. He taught us about generosity to the church as well. 
one of the things that he did is he always put quarters up on the kitchen ledge and we had individual envelopes for the church it wasn't a family envelope we all had our own and we had to put the quarter our quarters in there and make sure that when the plate came by that it popped in to the um, offering plate I think there's a few stories in our family where that didn't quite happen but we'll leave that to our family <clears throat> dad was generous with his time he spent time with a lot of this, several gentlemen in the community that didn't have family or were outcasts for unknown reasons to me. Often he'd invite them over for dinner to share a meal and some conversation with our family. Now I'm not sure how my mom felt about this arrangement, but she cooked the meal regardless. And this happened all the time. We would have somebody showing up for a meal. One of the men was Herb Thom. He was a soldier in the war that was shell-shocked. Today, we'd probably call it PTSD. And he was a bit odd and different. People, you know, didn't talk to him much. But not my dad. <laughs> he said, you know, Herb has to eat like the rest of us. So he'd invite him over. Dad would get in a car and drive with Mom and whichever kid was around, probably me, and drive 100-plus miles on a Sunday afternoon just to visit family or friends. And we did this a lot. So he wanted to get there to share a meal, play some cards, and just be with them and keep contact with them. I can remember many Sunday evenings pulling into that garage, and it would be well after midnight, and then having to get up to go to school the next day. He loved his brothers and sisters, enjoyed them, loved them all the time, and they loved him. It was just a fun thing to see this family of 15 just so enjoy each other. To the point that, you know, in the days um, when be before the Internet, we would write letters. Do you remember that? Well, my, the, his family had this cool thing called the round robin. And what they did is the first person, let's say my father, would write a letter, send it to the next sibling. That sibling would add a letter to that with other letters, send it to the next one. And it would go completely around these 15 people. And I had um, uncles and aunts that were in other countries. But it would go around to all of them until my father got it back with all the letters. He would take his letter out, put a new letter in, pictures, and it would go around again. This happened for 35 plus years. We remember when the round robin would show up and we'd all get so excited because we'd get news of family, cousins, we'd get to see pictures, how people have grown. And they were very good at sometimes two to three months for it to go around. But it was something we always looked forward to. He was generous with his volunteerism. He was justice of the peace of our county, a fireman, a city councilman, part of the Walton Society, um, a conservation group. Uh, he was the county weatherman. He reported the weather to the uh, National uh, Weather Service for 25 plus years. He was on church council, sang in the choir, but his proudest contribution, and this was actually, this picture of him was from one of these events, and I love that he has a, uh, a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand. If that wasn't a picture of the era then, um, was his fourth degree night of the Knights of Columbus. He was very proud of that and actually was buried in that full regalia when he was uh, departed us. He was a godly man with generous time and talent and treasure, and I had a good role model. The other influence I do want to comment on real quickly that came from both parents was prayer. But I got to tell you this story about my father committing this. Um, we had some missionaries come through, and they asked us to pray for um, the conversion of Russia from communism, of all things. And my father said or made a commitment in writing that our family would pray the rosary every night for three years. And we did. We have so many stories in our family about praying the rosary, just praying it really fast. Or, you know, we had to get on to watching the Lone Ranger or something. But what we did is we would eat dinner, and then we'd have to kneel down at our chair, and we would pray right there. Table, the dishes were still dirty, but we would sit there and pray the rosary. And we did that for three-plus years. And they always said that uh, that's what held us together. Siblings, my siblings and me, we're a very close family as well. It's a blessing passed on from my father's family. And we contribute to the expression from Father Patrick P Payton that says, the family that prays together stays together. 
I can find several passages in scripture about how my dad influenced me, but I chose Acts 20, um, verse 35, which says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in a way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. My father was blessed. He, from all that he came from, he was blessed, and we were blessed to call him our dad. So happy Father's Day, Dad. So please join me in a prayer of praise for fathers. We give our thanks, Creator Father, for the fathers in our lives. Let us praise those fathers who have striven to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. Let us praise those fathers who, lacking a good model for a father, have worked to become a worthy and virtuous father. Let us praise those fathers who, by their own account, were not always there for their children, but who continue to offer those children, now grown, their love and support, as well as let's pray for those fathers who have been wounded by words and actions of their children. Let us praise those fathers who, despite marital discord, have remained in their child's life. Let us praise those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support have nurtured a thriving life. Let us praise for those fathers who as stepfathers freely choose the obligation of fatherhood and earn their stepchildren's love and support. Let us praise those fathers who have lost a child to death and continue to hold the child in their heart. Let us praise those men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. Let us praise those men who have fathered us as their roles as mentors and guides. And let us praise those men who have, are about to become fathers. May they openly delight in their children. And let us praise those fathers who have died, but live in our memory and whose love continues to nurture us. In your holy and beautiful name, amen. Please join us in our final song. <laughs> Please stand in body or spirit as we sing our closing hymn. be seated for a few announcements. So we have a few things coming up that we want to make you aware of. First off, there are no community groups this week, and I want to make you aware of that, that we're going to continue the community groups, but there are quite a few that are going to take a summer break. So we probably won't have nearly the announcements. We're also looking for ideas on how you want to build community. Is there a, uh, I know that uh, Peggy McNeese is in charge of this. But um, anything that you want to get started that we've talked about, would love to have that conversation. Um, it's here. It's here. It's here. And we are going to have the kids do the kids walk through this Saturday. We invite you, whether you have a child or not, would you please come and join the fun? 
um, show them the community that we have here. We have these little, little, um, goodie bags that we're putting together for the kids, and Kevin needs help. So he's saying on Wednesday afternoon, uh, 1 o'clock to 3, if you could drop by and help him with that, you can help him put these fun things together. Oh, it didn't make it. But a lo fun little bag of goodies for the kids for that day, also to help us just celebrate children in our community. We'd love to have you come out for that. It's 2 to 5 next week. On July 4th, for you who are here, we do have a short congregational meeting. We have to nominate Kathy Roper as the Connections Elder. We are so grateful to Kathy for her willingness to step into that role as elder. And uh, so we want to honor her by saying, yes, we want you, Kathy. So if you can just remember that, after that, we'll just hang in there for a very, very brief meeting to, to nominate her. Guess what? Family Promise is here. And we're going to have one more time at the Sumner House the week of July 11th. So in standard fashion, if you can volunteer to host in the evening or stay overnight uh, and host, that would be so greatly appreciated, as well as creating meals. Pet. I don't know if we have anything new on the meals yet. We'll wait with announcements. Okay. Um, but we need meal preparation. So Jackie Tyler is the one to reach out if you want to have meals for the family. We'll get specifics on how many families are in there. I know we're having a big churn of families, which is good news, right, um, that many of our families have graduated. So that's all good. So contact um, Pat about that. Uh, I want you to be aware and get on your calendar July 18th from 1 to 3 after church, we are going to celebrate Bill with a big party out in our lawn. Um, be real simple, hot dogs and hamburger type meal, but we want to um, celebrate his family and all that so that on the 25th we can keep it more about the service. Um, but put that on your calendar for that afternoon to join us here for that. And I'm trying to think, Father's Day, yes, Father's Day. As Kevin said, if you're a father, if you know a father, if you had a father, if you're going to become a father, if you were a father, whatever, there's a bag handy for you. Please go grab that as we're stepping out. Have I forgotten anything, Kevin? Okay, was there any other announcements? Beautiful. Then let's stand and have our charge and benediction. Listen to what the Lord says. I have loved you with everlasting love, and still I maintain my unfailing love towards you. For I became a father to you, and you are my firstborn child. Go here in confidence, knowing that the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit goes with you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Okay, why don't we offer the peace to each other today? And have a great week, everyone.